I do. I have always been a bee lover, um, and I'm one of those people who very carefully distinguishes between bees and yellow jackets because I'm deathly allergic to yellow jackets. But as far as I know, I'm not allergic to bees, and yellow jackets will just go after you, as you know. And bees are just only doing their work and minding their own business, very much like poets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> out in the fields of flower, right? So bees are just, uh, they're so important to our ecosystems. They're so important to our food systems. And they also are just a great pleasure to have and to watch in the garden. Agreed. And they have, they're such a, a present force in poetry as well for a long time. Yeah, well, I think that, that poets identify with bees um, in a way, the way in which they're just sort of going about their business from, from flower to flower and trying to gather their material, which they'll then turn into something, right, completely different. So I have a little bit of a, um, a fragment from Horace, book four, section two, Augustus's Return. I create my verses in the manner of a humble Matinian bee that goes gathering pollen from all the pleasant time and labors among the many groves on the banks of flowing Tiber. So here that comparison is completely direct, right? The bee does this and it's very, very similar to what I do. And then, you know, a couple of thousand odd years later, we have the German poet Rilke writing in a letter to his friend. So it is important not only not to run down and degrade all that is here, but just because of its provisionalness, which it shares with us, these phenomena and things should be understood and transformed by us in a most fervent sense. Transformed, yes. For it is our task to imprint this provisional, perishable earth so deeply, so patiently and passionately in ourselves that its reality shall arise in us again invisibly. We are the bees of the invisible. So again, you have that direct comparison of the labor of the bees to the labor of the, of the poet and the way in which the gathering occurs and then later, right, something magical happens. And I also really like in this Rilke, the sense of the perishability of the earth that we're so aware of right now. And we're so aware also of the fragility of the bees that create the earth as we know it for us. So what do you believe to be the importance of bees, not just in the world, but in literature? Well, you know, I think it's that, the, the thing about literature is that um, the difference between literary writing and like um, scientific writing or an instruction manual is that in an instruction manual, if they tell you to put screw A into hole A and screw it in, you expect at the end of the process, if you followed your instructions absolutely exactly, that you're gonna have a bookshelf from Ikea, right? Or whatever that is. Whereas in literature, everything is doing more than one thing at once. You don't want that in a scientific paper, but in literature, the work is to create um, a complex space for the reader to hang out for a while and feel some things and um, put some things together, right? And come out in some ways like the honey of the bees transformed. And so the bee in a piece of literature is always itself, but also simultaneously always something else at the same time. Yeah, that's so true. I see that you co-directed the Utah Symposium of Science, um, science and Literature, um, and you connect those two disciplines really well. Can you tell us a little bit more about your time as um, directing the Utah Symposium in Science and Literature? 
Right, and I'm still doing it, except for reasons that are clear to everybody. We're on hiatus right now. My um, my co-director Fred Adler, who's a biologist and mathematician, who actually studies ants, by the way, who studies insects, oh, wow. um, and is and is a hugely smart and interesting person, um, are now in touch about, well, should we do one on disease? Well, isn't everybody really sick of disease right now? Um, should, you know, should we do one on chaos? <laughs> what, what should the yes. next one be? Um, and uh, we've sort of resisted. We haven't really wanted to do a Zoom symposium, but, you know, that might just be the the future of the next one. The uh, idea behind it was, was really my powerful sense that the pro, even though the discourse of the scientist and the discourse of the poet are, are very, very different from each other, we're all engaged together in the same project, which is to gain an understanding and one hopes a sort of revelatory understanding of reality as it is. And you absolutely, require for this, those people who will observe the world and describe it as exactly as they see and understand it in that moment, and who understand at the same time that at some moment in the future, their own observations and descriptions may well be obsolete, right? Because people have new understandings of how things are operating. Um, you, ha you have to have those people. And I think that you also have to have um, those people who are constantly examining reality in a relational kind of way and in, a, in an epistemological kind of way, who are understanding that our experience of reality in the moment is really conditioned by who we are, where we are, the lenses that we're using for looking. We think of all of those painters who um, went blind late in their lives, right? And how their paintings changed. Um, we think of those composers who were losing their hearing later in life and whose musical compositions changed as a result, right? So you realize that experience and observation are actually located in an individual self with um, literal and figurative points of view and that are understanding of reality is always enhanced when we're considering as many possible points of view and elements of reality as we can get to. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. From your observations and long study of poetry and, and love of bees, um, do you have a favorite poem um, or literary work about bees that you want to share? So my favorite is a little tiny Dickinson poem that I think you guys have already, I think you put it up as the very first poem um, yes. on your site when you were launching. And it's Emily Dickinson's poem, number 1779. And it, it, if you'll indulge me, I think what I'll do is I'll read this really short little poem. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And then I'll talk about it for a second. And then I'll read... Um, a little bit of a piece of an essay, just a tiny piece that um, I've been writing that includes um, my thinking about this poem as it is right at the moment. Yes. And I just got finished, yeah. And I just got finished teaching a class where I reminded my students that, you know, every journey through a poem is different, even if it's the same person making the journey. So mm -hmm. I'll say that what I'm gonna to say today represents my relationship to the poem right now, but come back in five years and see, right? Um, yeah. what it is. So this is Dickinson's poem, 1779, um, and it's known as To Make a Prairie. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. One clover and a bee and reverie the reverie alone will do if bees are few. And I chose this one, or I love this partly because I was talking about instruction manuals just a minute ago. This poem is an instruction manual, right? It's an instruction in, to the reader in how to make a prairie. But of course, anyone who's really paying attention will know that if you do, if you follow these instructions, you're not gonna end up with an Ikea bookcase, much less a prairie <laughs> <laughs> right? out of this. Um, and Dickinson, who was a 
serious gardener and also very well trained in botany would have known um, that first of all, e even if you're working with um, clover that propagates through pollination, you can't make one with one clover and one bee. You need right. to start with two clovers. <laughs> at, least, right? at a minimum, you need to start with two clovers. And if you're dealing with the kind of clover that propagates, because there are both kinds, that propagates by roots underground, and this is most prairie clovers, you actually don't need any bees for that. The clover mm. can take care of that all by itself. And then the other thing that you realize is that either way, if you're starting with two clovers and a bee or only clover, um, it's gonna take like hundreds of years <laughs> for this to happen. It doesn't just happen every day. And then you notice that there's that weird it in there. She doesn't say to, to make a prairie take a clover and one bee. She says it takes a clover and one bee. And so then you have to ask, mm -hmm. well, who's this it? What is this it? Is this nature that's operating? Is this God that's operating? So maybe she's not telling me um, how to make a prairie at all. And then you get huh. that turn. Yeah. And then you get that turn into length three, which takes the poem into a whole different realm because she says, and reverie. And then you think, which is daydreaming, right? And then you think, well, mm -hmm. you know, how does, she's really moved this into the mind. The prairie is being made not out in the world, but in the poem and in the mind of the poet and in the mind of the reader. And then she takes the final step, which is the reverie alone will do if bees are few. So you don't actually even need bees. You just need the idea of bees. You just need the metaphor of bees, right? And the clover for this, for this um, prairie to get, to get made. Yeah. Um, so, right? So this is the difference between science writing and poetry. Yeah. It's science writing probably wouldn't talk about daydreams, but they're nonetheless important. <laughs> they're nonetheless important. And in fact, and a scientific journal would never publish something that said, well, all you really need is daydreams. You don't right. need the, right, any clover <laughs> or any bees. So, so the little paragraph that um, I'm going to read to you from my essay, um, I'm thinking about this poem and I've done something like what I just did to you describing the instruction manual thing. Mm -hmm. And another poem that comes in here is um, Sappho has this wonderful poem in which she has a red apple flying in the top of an, of an otherwise bare apple tree. So that gets mentioned in here mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So like the poet, a bee works and works again over her blossom, gathering and stuffing her little thigh pouches until it seems impossible she might still fly. The blossom keeps yielding, and between bee and flower, I am entirely carried away, flying like an apple, or rather like a bee loaded down. The poem has found and instructed me, as it tells me in its last turn, not in agra or apiculture, but in reverie, the making of a dream of clover over which a bee in her singular resonant multitude browses, as do I, conjured objects and revered. Clover, apple, bee, release me into the dreaming field of poetry. And this is the poem's instruction. Neither for me honey, nor the honeybee, says Anne Carson's Sappho. And yet between them, Sappho and Carson, like Dickinson, give us both. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I enjoyed that. The last question I wanted to ask is, um, how have bees and pollinators um, come into play in your life and your life's work? Well, um, I'm, I'm glad you extended that to pollinators. I know that's really what your festival is about. Yeah. Yeah. Not just honeybees, not just bees, but, 
butterflies, birds, spiders, um, so many different insects are pollinators too. And we always, we tend to forget that because native bees are the most efficient pollinators. Yeah. Um, so we actually have um, a couple of mason bee houses on our property. Oh, nice. Um, so we, uh, in good, I mean, you've heard about, you said in my work and you've, you've heard more than enough about the poetry, but um, we actually, we live um, sort of high up overlooking City Creek Canyon. So if you go over the ridge at the top of I Street, we're just on the other side, oh, perched nice. and, um, and looking out on the canyon. And um, one of the things that we did sort of over time after we moved in here was to try to bring um, our property back as close to wild as we could get it while still not upsetting the neighbors. <laughs> um, and, and mostly we have a couple of neighbors who, uh, who have some questions for us, but um, mostly our neighbors, they like to walk by the house and sort of stand and look down at our, we have woods and um, etc. And we have a couple of mason bee houses and over time we've planted really carefully for um, butterflies and also for hummingbirds. And then on the canyon side of the house we feed um, a whole bunch of different birds and I don't take credit for this because it's my husband who is a scientist who knows exactly what seed or nectar mixtures to put out at exactly a particular kind of time of year and we usually manage he usually manages to get the feeders change really within a few days of when we see that bird who's only here you know from from July to September or who's only here in the winter time um, or who's only here near Mother's Day, right, or whatever. Um, so we, we try to keep the property as active with as many pollinators. And we also get, um, you know, foxes and very occasionally moose and the odd bobcat who comes and eats the raccoons who also enjoy the feeders and we have a, a little herd of deer that lives just on the other side of our carport and yet we're you know five minutes from downtown and 10 minutes from the university which is which is really nice but we've actually um and especially my husband has been really active in researching what we need to do to keep all kinds of wildlife, but especially the pollinators happy and um, mm -hmm. living on the property. Oh, wow, that's so great. You have a whole menagerie in your yard and, yeah. and it sounds like your, your husband brings in the science and you bring in the poetry and the, you know, the art, the artistry in there. And I'm sure that's, they love it. It sounds like. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think that they care about the poetry nearly as much as they do about the seed and the nectar and the right plants. But I will say that he brings the animals, and I write about them. Yes. So then so. people know about how important they are, and um, you know what a wonder they are to this world, and that's important too. Keeping people yeah. inspired. Yeah, how much pleasure, right? And how much pleasure they bring us. Yeah, yeah. I just so appreciate you contributing so much poetry to the fest and showing us what poem, where bees do arise in poetry from throughout the ages. And um, it's just really special to look at that relationship. Well, you know, the, I guess the last thing that I would say, poets are always interested in nature. And there's yeah. a long, you know, many century history of nature poetry and also of agricultural poetry. Yeah. Poets consider themselves as, as people who in some ways are growers and nurturers of the natural world. And so it makes total sense that an interest in bees and pollinators would be a part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks again so much and um, happy Bee Fest. 
<laughs> yeah, happy Bee Fest to you too. Uh, we still are seeing a couple of bees up here. Are you guys seeing them down there as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, we just took a tour of Wasatch Community Gardens' um, Green Phoenix Farm last week, and there were all kinds of, you know, they have a couple of honeybees on the farm, but they also had all these native bees, and they're so tiny. So it, yeah, just kind of getting from an expert hearing, oh, those are bees, um, <laughs> these little tiny bugs you and see. They're, and they're the most important ones. Those and they're the, the most important, ones. exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. All right. Well, yeah. good luck with the festival and uh, thanks for asking me to take part. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking part.